What's up you guys? So something I've gotten asked quite a lot about is actually how I go about compiling my own Groth and Trough documents. One of the biggest reasons for this is the fact that the workflow isn't exactly straightforward, especially when you compare it to tools like LaTeX that usually use just one command to compile everything. Instead, it's a bit more of a workaround and the compilation process is a bit more finicky, but luckily in this video I'll be showing off how you guys can make it a lot easier using a simple script that you can have set up to use defaults that you like, as well as how you can create make files that can do all this sort of stuff for you. Now before we get into the video, one thing I want to clarify is are you guys using Groff? Are you guys using Trough? Then how are you not subscribed? Come on guys. I expect all of you guys to be hit that bell icon so you guys get notified of the next Groff and Trough content. If you guys are enjoying this, make sure to let me know by liking this video, as well as join my Discord. My Discord, we talk a lot about Trough, we talk a lot about Groff. For those of you guys that are active in my Discord, you definitely know that I am always there to help out if anybody has any problems. Anyways, without any more delays, let's go ahead and show off that simple script that you guys can use to set up some defaults. It's pretty simple. In fact, it's actually based off of Luke Smith's script called Compile which is pretty similar and you guys can go ahead and look in the description and I'll have them both linked down below. Anyways, let's go take a look at it. All right, so this is the file in question. This is actually just a simple script for compiling everything. So here I have defaults for a bunch of different languages, but the big use case here is for trough. So in this case, I have it just set up to use Groff because it's a lot more simple to demo. You can set this up for Neatroff as well, but it does take a few more steps, but you'll be able to quickly adapt this to work with Neatroff by the end of this video. Now, just to clarify why I say it takes a couple extra steps is mostly because of the fact that Groff has a wrapper around a bunch of different programs that it calls by using the command Groff. And so here I'm saying Groff dash TPS, which means to postscript. And then it has all these flags here, which basically tell it to use a bunch of preprocessors. I pretty much call, I think possibly almost all the preprocessors that you could dash ms just means the macros to use and then give it a file which will be the file that we're compiling and it passes that into ps2 pdf which turns the postscript into a pdf file and then finally it outputs that to the file of the same name dot pdf and so because of this it makes the workflow a lot easier because all you have to do is just do a compiler and then give it the file so pretty straightforward. Now, the big thing to stress here is the fact that I use .ms and then .me, .mm. So these are all different settings for different macros. A lot of this could probably be simplified and I could just have this change. The big thing to note here is that I have it using all the preprocessors by default. Now you guys don't need to do this, but that's kind of how I like to do it is just have my default run everything. And then when I make my actual final project or something like that, I can create a make file for it and strip out everything I don't use. Now, just to show off how you guys can actually use this. So here I have just a quick demo and all you have to call. So you have to just use these commands. You do compiler, so compiler, and then you just give it the current file, all right? So .ms and then that will compile and then we can open it up and there we go. So there's our final output. So pretty straightforward and it simplifies the process a lot more. For those of you that are Vim users, you can actually simplify this a bit more by just doing set make prog equals and then we can just do compiler backslash space and then you're just gonna go percent. This basically tells it to run compiler on the current file when we run make. So if I just do make, it will, as we see down here, run the compiler script on the current file. And then if we just open that up, there it is right there. Now you guys could go ahead and expand on this more, maybe simplify things a bit more, but that's how I like to set things up for myself. Then when I go back to make, so say I have a make file in here, all I have to do is just do set make prog equals make. Pretty straightforward. Then I can compile it just doing make. And then it will obviously just run whatever the make file here is. Uh, here I have it just set up to echo the current directory. That was just kind of what I set up ahead of time. All right, now let's go ahead and get into how you guys can set up a simple make file. So just to make things simple, we're just gonna make a directory and we're just gonna call it trough make. And then we're gonna copy that temp.ms into trough make. And then we're just gonna CD into trough make, all right? And so now if I ls, I will have that temp file. Now I'm gonna go ahead and edit a make file and it will give us a simple blank file that we can go ahead and start off with. All right, so now let's make a really simple format for our make file. So we're just gonna go ahead and we're just going to start off really simple. We wanna make tmp.pdf and then tmp.ms is what is needed. And then it's gonna go graph-ms and then take the actual file. And then we're just gonna put that all into tmp.pdf to make things simple. And then we're gonna actually use dash t PDF to tell it what format to use. So now if we just ran make 
and then we open the PDF. There you go. So we've compiled our first PDF using this. Now, while this works, we probably want to try and make this a bit more general purpose and make it so that way we can expand on it and adapt it later on. So the best way to start off is we're going to actually delete this and we're going to make it basically use the suffixes. So you'll understand what I mean in just a sec. So here it's actually going to use any .ms file to make the associated .pdf file. And then it will use the same command, but here, as you can see, I replaced the file with this. And all this means is to just basically take whatever is required. So now instead, what this basically means is it means this is now this. So pretty simple, they're the same sort of thing. And so now if I run make, you're gonna see no target. So the reason for this is that we haven't given a target. So we can do all will be our default target. And then we're gonna basically do PDF. And so there is our default target. Now still, if we run make, it's gonna give us an issue. And so now what we'll need to add is some suffixes. So the suffixes work pretty simply. We're just going to add this little block of text right here and then add whatever suffixes we used. So we used a .ms and then a .pdf suffix. So we have to use the suffixes here, and then that way make knows that they exist and they can be used with a suffix rules. Now, one of the biggest advantages to using make for this is that it will intelligently know when it needs to recompile. For example, if I run make right now, it will say there's nothing to be done because we've already compiled our PDF. But if I open a, another window with our actual MS file in here and I just save it, then we have updated it. So let's say we add hello and then we save it. Now, if I just open this up, you'll see that our changes haven't happened. But if I run make now, it will compile it. Now, once again, if I run make, it will say there's nothing to be done because it doesn't need to be recompiled. This is super convenient because if you set up things like automatically running make whenever you save, it can be pretty useful as well as having it set up so that way, say if you have a bunch of different files that are all connected to each other, you can have it only run when certain files are compiled. This is super convenient when you're working with a huge project, for example, like a thesis that maybe has a title and you don't really want to recompile the title every single time, it can make things a bit easier. Now, while this is great for Groff, we probably want to make this abstracted so we can use different troughs with it. For example, using it with Neatroff is a pretty good use case. Now, a little known fact about how Groff actually works is it is a wrapper around a bunch of extra tools. So if we wanted to break this down, we could do it really simply. You see what this is actually doing? This is running trough, and then it's taking the MS macros, and it's basically taking the file, and then it's going out to here. Now, before that, it actually has to go through grow PS, which is a post processor that turns the general output of trough into postscript, or in fact, actually, I guess we wanna make it PDF, and then it will actually convert all that to the proper output. Now, for those of you guys that are Neatroff users, you'll think, oh, this is super similar to how Neatroff works. And in fact, if we wanted to abstract this a bit more, we'd actually just use pipes. So we'd instead pipe this into here and we can just do cat to simplify things a bit more. And so now if we just save that, it will work the exact same way. But since Neatroff actually doesn't take a file in any of its commands for the most part, you have to cat things through or use a shell redirect, which I'm not really gonna go over. It's pretty simple. I just find this sort of thing makes the pipeline a bit more clear for other people that are looking at it. So now that we're starting to get a bit more abstracted, we probably want to actually learn about how we can implement preprocessors in here, which is pretty straightforward. In fact, let's just add some equation let's just do sqrt of five so the square root of five so now if we compile that it's just going to put the text there because it's not being pre-processed so to pre-process it we actually pipe this through eqn and then pipe that into trough so now when we save that and compile it it will give us our square root as we'd expect so now we can pipe things through pretty simply using like TBL and then let's put a table in here and then just saving that and compiling it, we get a nice table right here. So as you guys can see, there's a pretty simple workflow. Now, something that you're gonna wanna notice is that if you use an equation inside of a table, you have to make sure to run table before EQN. The reason for this is that it basically allows it to know where to put everything. Now, something that you're gonna notice is that we actually had something change up here. In fact, our symbols are not working and looking the way that we would expect, because this is actually supposed to be a accented O or whatever you call that, um, but instead it's some weird A up here. So what we actually have to do is since Groff itself does not actually support UTF-8, you actually have to use pre-conv and then pipe that through. And so now when we save that and recompile it, we will get everything proper. Precon basically converts it into something that Groff can understand. 
Now, as you guys can see, we're starting to get quite the pipeline here. And so the best way that I'd recommend to simplify your preprocessors is to actually go up here and make a macro called pre. Uh, you can kind of do this however you'd like, but this is how I like to do it. And then we can just basically add pre in here. And there we go. And now we can kind of simplify our pipeline, save that, compile it, and it should all look the same. Now, because of this, we can actually take things like maybe remove EQN and then compile that again and it stops working. So you can kind of adapt it pretty easily using this sort of thing. On top of that, you can kind of abstract it a bit more by maybe setting rof equals trough um, dash tpf or whatever you want to do. You could probably simplify that a bit more, but we're just going to do um, trough. All right. And then we can go down here and set it up to use rof. And there we go. So now everything's back to normal. Now, something I'd recommend is instead of actually going to PDF directly, I'd recommend going to PostScript and then on top of that, having another rule that does dot PS to PDF and then using PS to PDF. And then it takes the input and there we go. Now it'll make the associated PDF and this kind of makes things a bit easier. And then we just change this to PostScript. And then finally we change this to grow PS. Now, since this command's starting to get a bit long, we can actually simplify it a bit more by just using a backslash to start it on the next line. Um, that can kind of simplify things a bit more. Now, another abstraction that we may want to do is abstracting our post processor. So here I'll just do post uh, for postscript, and then we'll do post equals grow ps. All right, so now we've got a pretty general structure that we can expand to actually work with other troughs. So really simply, we've got all this stuff, so now we can actually adapt this using Neetrof. So now you'll see we have our settings up here, and I've added a bunch of settings for Neetrof, so I'm just gonna remove the ones that we're not actually using. So in this case, we can leave all these as they are. For the most part, we should be able to use them. Thing here is that we actually define a path here, because by default, Neetrof um, installs in different places, and so I just like to give it an absolute path to where I have it installed. If you guys have it installed just in your base directory or anything like that, you can adapt this. But the advantage of doing this is that you can actually do stuff like changing it to pwd um, slash dot dot or something like that to basically work a bit easier and you don't have to actually have Neetrof installed. You can put it in different directories, all that sort of stuff. So giving it an absolute path does have its pros. It also has its cons. And as you guys can see, I have a few extra settings that I actually have added in here. On top of this, you can do gs and that will basically set things up to use Neetrof's fonts. And then you'll see that there's a few other things, like I actually have the preprocessor set up as well as the preprocessors for it. Now I have this all saved in a separate file to use as a snippet, so that way I can quickly alternate between different troughs and make it work easily in between the two of them. Now, a few things that I wanna mention is that I actually also have post and rof opts. So those actually have to be added in here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add our rof opts which is basically just a bunch of options that we can go ahead and set up, as well as giving it our post processor options. And now in theory, if I didn't mess this up, because usually I use a general template, so there's probably somewhere in here that I've made a minor mistake, this should all pretty much work. So now if we save that and compile it, there we go. So it all seems to have worked and it's compiled with Neetrof. We can check by just looking at the command it used and looking at it and seeing, oh my God, that's a long command. That's because it's using the absolute paths and we can see that it seems to have all worked. So this is pretty sweet. Now we can kind of simplify things a bit more. Maybe we don't want to give it, have it output this entire long command. I usually like to keep it, but you could silence it just by using the at symbol. Now, the great thing about this is that now we've pretty much abstracted things and we can apply this to whatever trough we want. We can change it. So say for example, like we had before, we could just switch out. So let's just swap all this and then comment all this out and save. And then compiling it, we switch back to gruff. And so the advantage to this is that it's a lot more flexible. So now something I haven't actually shown off that's pretty useful is having a clean command. So now this will just basically remove our postscript and PDF files. So now if I save that and then we make again, there's nothing to do, we can't compile it again. And so no matter how many times we run make, it will keep saying there's nothing to do for all. So now what we can do is we can do make clean and it will remove it. Now it'll say, oh, I can't find any postscript files. Uh, you could go ahead and do, I think dash F is force. And there we go. So it will simplify things a bit more if you guys wanted to do that. I highly recommend it and it's super convenient. 
Now, something that you will want to do is maybe simplify this a bit more, maybe give it a general way to determine what we want to compile to a PDF. And so how I like to do it is I use a really simple snippet. Let me see if I can find it right here. I'm just going to try and explain this as we go. So this setup is pretty simple. It's basically going to list all the files in the directory by time, and then it's basically going to check and see if it has rough ext, uh, which we can actually go ahead and set to ms. So we're going to be doing rough ext equals ms. So now it's basically going to see, does anything end with ms? If so, that is our last file. And then finally, it will basically go ahead and make things a bit easier so we can actually do that. Now, finally, we can expand upon this a bit more and make it very generic by doing dollar sign last. And then we just go down here, change this to at, and this basically says just basically do whatever the name of this guy was, remove the end of it and replace it with PS. So in this case, it will do temp.ps, and then it should pretty much completely work out of the box. So now if we save that and make it, then we will get a nice simple pipeline right here, just like that. Now, finally, we can expand this a bit more by actually just doing E, and let's make a new file. So gav.ms, and then let's just put this text in there, and then we can save. And when it compiles, it will actually use this file. So now if we do fopf, we'll see that we actually have a gav file. All right, so how it's doing this is it's basically seeing what was the last edited thing? Oh, it was gav.ms, and then it compiles it. And so now we can make like maybe another change, um, like hello, and then save that and compile it. And there we go, we get hello added in there. Now we can actually save, and let's go ahead and go back to our temp file. So now if we just open that up, we get all this. And now let's just go ahead and make a little change. So let's do hello, let's add there. All right, and then if I save and compile it, bam, it knows to compile that file because it was the most recently compiled. Now, obviously, if you're working on a project and you know what files there are gonna be, this isn't completely necessary, and you'll probably just want to, if we go back to here, you'll probably just want to actually, instead of having all to last.pdf, you could maybe instead just give it whatever file you wanna compile. So if we only wanted to compile gav, then it will only work with gav, it won't try and uh, work with the other file. So if we go back and we make a change, so let's change that, and we try to compile, it won't compile because it'll say, oh, this isn't anything to do with our project, but maybe we want it to compile as well. We could go back and add it to the end, make, and there we go, and it will update it as we go. So this is pretty abstracted. You guys can adapt this to work for you, and I find it super helpful. Now you're probably asking yourself, Gavin, how can I adapt this so I don't have to type out all this stuff every single time? Well, the best way that I like to do it is I actually have snippets set up to do this for me automatically, but you guys can easily adapt this to work however you'd like. So for example, I have it set up so if I go down to the very bottom, I have some extra settings where I do trough and then expand the snippet and it will basically allow me to get the general layout that I like and then I can obviously make changes as I need. And then on top of that, I have different ones. So say for example, if I did Groff, it will expand and it will give me a similar thing to what my settings that I'd like for Groff. Or if I did Neetroff, it will give me all the settings I like for Neetroff. So pretty easy to adapt and work for you. And then this way you can kind of cut out um, having to remember everything off the top of your head. Now, if you guys don't want to use snippets or something like that, you can make this pretty easily just by doing R and then give it a file. So here I can go ahead and just do, um, let's see what files do we have. Let's have it read from this file and then it will just output the contents of that file. So this could be nice. Maybe you want to give a key binding or something like that and redirect the contents of a simple template that you have. So that way you can basically get a general template that you can use in whatever make file you'd like. Now, this is obviously a Vim specific thing, but you can easily set up snippets like this in whatever text editor you guys like, like Emacs. You can use this in VS Code if for whatever reason you do this in VS Code. Feel free to go ahead and do that. And then all this pretty much simplifies things. On top of that, you can actually set up special auto commands if you guys are Vim users. So in here are all my settings for trough. You guys can go ahead and check it out. It's in my FT plugin for trough settings. I have a bunch of different stuff in here. But one thing, 
that I have this really simple setup to basically run make. So you guys would want to do the lowercase make, but I do uppercase make, which is a special function that I have set up to do it asynchronously, but you guys don't need to do that. Um, if you guys want to learn how I do that asynchronously, let me know. I'd love to cover it in a future video. Ask me in the comments what you guys want to know about it, how you guys can set it up or anything like that. Let me know. Anyways, so I have it basically use this auto command here that basically checks whatever buffer, if it's been written, then run make, and that will basically give you automatic compiling. So if I just opened up, let's open up another terminal and let's just go full screen and then let's edit, let's edit this file. I've got a bunch of stuff in here. And then if I just save it, it runs make. All right, so as I said before in my home directory, I just have a make file that echoes my current working directory. And so um, that's not super useful, but in this case, I just have it there for some reason. But you guys can go ahead and run make right there and then use that when I save, automatically runs make as you can see down here. And it makes working with it a bit easier. Anyways, guys, I'll try to link to everything I possibly can down in the description. If there's anything I missed, let me know and I'll be sure to include it let me know if you guys want to know more about my workflow. I kind of wanted to make this pretty general and so that way it could be used with whatever trough you guys wanted because I know a lot of you guys are starting to get into knee trough as well as Groff. So let me know what you guys think. Let me know if there's something I could have done better. If you guys have a different template of your own, let us all know. Feel free to link it down below. I'd love to take a peek at it. Maybe, uh, maybe snag some of your code. Anyways. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys feel like you learned a bit. And I hope you guys have a better idea of how you guys can set up your workflow to be a lot more simple using Make. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you next time.